chances are you or someone you know has had a lung disease called pneumonia. Now, fortunately, there's treatment for pneumonia and most people will get over this disorder. However, there's up to 50,000 deaths per year, according to the CDC. So today we're gonna to talk about what makes this illness so serious, what are the potential causes, what are some of the risk factors that make people more susceptible to complications, and of course, we're gonna go over the relevant anatomy as it relates to pneumonia. So let's get to it. So let's start with a definition of pneumonia. Pneumonia is inflammation of the lung tissue caused by infection. Maybe some of you have heard of a term called pneumonitis. Pneumonitis is still inflammation of the lung tissue. However, it's kind of distinguished from pneumonia by being a non-infective type of inflammation. Whereas pneumonia is inflammation caused by an infection like viruses and bacteria. Before we get into how the viruses and bacteria get all the way down into the lung tissue, let's actually show you some lungs. So here you can actually see a left lung. For you anatomy geeks out there, you can tell us why it's a left lung in our comments below, and we'll address it in another video. But one of the first things that students ask when they see this is, one, what are all these black lines here or purplish lines there? Are those like from smoking or disease states? And no, those are actually from all these little blood vessels just penetrating through the lung tissue because the main function of the lungs is to exchange as much carbon dioxide and oxygen with the bloodstream as possible. And one of the things that's cool about lung tissue is its soft and elastic nature. These tissues just stretch and fill with air. And one of the reasons why the stretch is so great is because when they stretch, they actually have this elastic recoil, which actually helps you breathe out. And we'll talk about what happens in certain disease states in another video when you lose that elasticity in the lungs. Just real quick, I wanna also show you a right lung, just because I want the anatomy geeks out there to tell us what is wrong with this right lung. Spoiler alert, it's not the discoloration, that's just some dryness because the preservative has, some hard has a hard time penetrating that tissue here. When most of us think about developing pneumonia, we probably think about bringing something in from the outside world, like the bacteria and the viruses that we mentioned earlier. And even though that is the most common pathway of how we get infected with pneumonia, we actually have new information and we know that the lung tissue is actually not sterile. What that means is the lungs have their own microbiome or normal flora, or maybe you've heard of like good bacteria. And so this good bacteria or microbiome residing in the lung tissue is typically held in check by a healthy individual's immune system. But say you have an immunosuppressed person or maybe your immune system is taxed from fighting another infection, those bacteria that are residing in there, what we call the good bacteria, could start to divide out of control. They call that local pathogen multiplication. And that can be the cause of certain types of pneumonia. However, like we mentioned earlier, the most common way of still developing pneumonia is bringing something in from the outside world. And it's typically done through this process called microaspiration, which is essentially some sort of secretion containing a pathogen gets brought down into the lung tissue. Now, the most common cause of pneumonia is something called streptococcus pneumoniae or streptococcus pneumoniae, pneumoniae, potato, potato, who cares? Most people refer to it as pneumococcus. It's a bacteria, which fortunately we've developed a vaccine for, which has helped lower the rates of pneumonia caused by this bacteria. But one of the things I wanna show is how the bacteria moves down all the way into the lung tissue. And many of you have probably heard of the trachea and the windpipe, and I'm gonna show you that in a second. But before I show you, I want you to think about this. This is kind of crazy. The trachea is the first tube. There are 23 generations of tubes off of one tube. If you've ever played the calculator game and done like two times two and then equals, 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 do that 23 times and you're in the millions. So you start with one tube that eventually branches into millions. It's pretty remarkable and amazing. So let's show this trachea that I just mentioned here. So you can see where the probe is running down. This is the trachea or that first tube that I mentioned. And what's awesome about this thing is you can actually see these little cartilaginous rings that actually help hold the trachea open at all times. You compare that to the esophagus behind, which that's collapsed, which is okay, because we shouldn't be eating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but we definitely are breathing all the time. Now, we mentioned 23 generations, meaning this tube branches and branches and branches. 
And the first branch of the trachea are these main or primary bronchi. Now, a lot of you have heard of bronchitis, which is for another video, but here are the first branches of the trachea. Now, the next thing we're gonna use because the cadaver dissection just ends there is I'm gonna jump over to one of our pictures that we got from Codex Anatomicus, which has got some really cool anatomical artwork that I'm gonna show you right here. This is a really cool rendition of the lungs and the bronchial tree. This is from Codex Anatomicus. We'll put their link in the description and they're offering a 25% discount to anybody who uses our coupon code on their website. So if you're interested in anatomical artwork, check them out, they've got some really cool stuff. But back to our discussion of the bronchial tree, again, coming back to this structure, that's the trachea, which we already mentioned. And just to be clear, every time you have a branch in anatomy, or a branch in a tube in anatomy, they change the name, which is a joy for all students to memorize more names, right? So the next one, again, is the main or primary bronchi, which we previously mentioned on the dissection. As it branches again, we get to these structures called lobar bronchi because they're going to individual lobes of the lungs. Continuing the branching, you get to things called segmental bronchi. And we don't stop at the segmental bronchi. We continue to branch to bronchioles, which are just smaller bronchi, down to these structures called alveolar ducts. And they form into alveolar sacs, which kind of look like a cluster of grapes with all the pictures you see of these. And then each individual grape in that little cluster or the alveolar sac is called an alveolus or alveoli for plural. So this is where the magic happens in the lungs at the level of the alveolar sacs and the alveoli because these are engulfed with these tiny little blood vessels called pulmonary capillaries. And this is where we can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide with the bloodstream. So something really important to address here. If we have anything that interferes with oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries, that can be a problem. And that's why pneumonia can be a problem because pneumonia typically starts to create inflammation in the alveoli and alveolar sacs. So one of the things that our respiratory system tries to employ to keep pathogens out of the deeper lung tissue is to create some barriers on the inside lining of the tubing, like the trachea and the bronchi that we mentioned earlier. So if you take a look at this cadaver here, this is a different dissection here, and we actually have cut open the trachea here. And you can't actually see it with the naked eye, but there's a lining of tissue on the inside of the trachea would actually have these tiny little cells lined with cilia. And cilia are little cell-like projections that actually flutter. It's also interspersed with cells that produce a whole bunch of mucus. So when we breathe in dust particles, viruses, or bacteria, the hope is that they'll get caught in that mucus and then the cilia literally will flutter upwards. And once it gets to this point, you get a choice. That big ball of mucus, you can either spit out, or let's be honest, some of us have done the other thing, and swallowed it. Now, some people will be like, isn't that counterproductive to swallow it once it's been pushed up? The answer is no, because you move it out of the trachea to the tube behind that we showed earlier called the esophagus, and then it just moves that big ball of mucus down to your stomach. So remember, the trachea will continue to branch into the bronchial tree, and all those other bronchi will also have cells that produce mucus and the cilia that will kind of flutter and help push that out of there to catch potential dust particles and the pathogens. But as we move deeper and deeper down into the lung tissue, the cells start to lose their cilia. And so we're in the alveoli, those cells no longer have cilia, they're not producing quite as much mucus. And so if any dust particles and pathogens have made it past all the other bronchi, then we've gotta have some other backup defense. And in this case, we have these things called macrophages. These are white blood cells that engulf foreign invaders, and even debris in the dust particles. And a lot of the times, if you get a pathogen that makes it down to that level, they'll gobble it up and you might not even notice. But if you have more of a virulent pathogen, something that's uh, more infective or stronger, or you have a greater number of pathogens that make it down past those initial host defenses, the macrophages might get overwhelmed and they'll call for backup and they'll call for backup by releasing these chemicals in creating the inflammatory or initiating the inflammatory response. Once the inflammatory process starts, white blood cells will move in from the pulmonary capillaries into the alveoli and the alveolar sacs. 
which is good because that's what the macrophages kind of called upon when we initiated the inflammatory response. And now we have backup, more white blood cells to try to defend against this pathogen. One of the disadvantages of this though, is that fluid tends to move in with those white blood cells. And if you've got fluid in the alveolar sacs and in the alveoli, that's going to interfere with carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange. So when people have pneumonia, they often feel short of breath. That's one of the reasons why. You stick one of those pulse, pulse oximeters on their finger and you'll see that they're reading lower oxygen levels than they normally would because of this interference of carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange. Now many people also know the body will be coughing more, will, will create a cough reflex with pneumonia. The inflammatory response also initiates an increase in body temperature. So people will get the fever, chills, and the body aches. One other thing you'll see when people go to the doctor's office with pneumonia is they'll often get a chest x-ray. And the reason you can see pneumonia on a chest x-ray is because fluid shows up differently than air. In a healthy lung, the alveoli and the alveolar sacs should just have air in them. But in a lung that has pneumonia developing, fluid will be in there and that will show up differently with like little opacities or what we call infiltrates on a chest x-ray. So how do we treat pneumonia? Well, often we treat pneumonia with antibiotics. And this is because we know many of the typical pathogens that cause pneumonia are bacteria and antibiotics will kill bacteria. But what if it's a virus or a new virus? Well, we're at the mercy of our own immune system. And so our immune system would have to kill viruses. And the only thing we can do for viral pneumonia is what we would call what we call symptomatic or supportive therapies, like pushing fluids, you can use cough medicines, but if people get really, really sick and they end up in the hospital, that's when you'll have to almost help facilitate oxygen exchange by giving, putting them on ventilation or giving them high flow oxygen and things of that nature. So one of the other things that I wanted to mention is risk factors. Who's more at risk for developing pneumonia? The elderly are definitely more at risk due to the fact that the immune system tends to wax and wane as you age. And that's partly why they do a pneumovax or a vaccine that protects against some of the typical pathogens with pneumonia at a certain age. Other things that put people more at risk are lung diseases like COPD or other things that smoking, lung cancer, also, people who are on immunosuppressive drugs. If your immune system is suppressed, you're obviously going to be more susceptible to infections. And even healthy individuals, they can get more prone to getting pneumonia if they've got another infection going on. A lot of the times, pneumonia just doesn't develop out of the blue. Somebody starts with an upper respiratory tract infection or another or just an infection like bronchitis, and then pneumonia starts to develop afterwards. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and you learned something new about pneumonia. Just to let you know, our merchandise is up and running. So if you want to wear some snazzy IOHA attire, go ahead and look below. And like always, comment, let us know what you think of the video or any questions you have or suggestions for future videos.